So let's look at some uh, common case examples of some other things that we might see that are common radiographically that are not necessarily periodontal in origin. Uh, so take a look at that. Look closely at that image and make a mental note or put in chat what you see there. Did you identify that little lesion? You've got some rotation on that third premolar, but the blatant thing there is that little lesion. So when you have something like that that's in the unattached gingiva, like you have here, which is above that line of demarcation that you see at the at the butt of that arrow, you see that line there that kind of continues on. You've got pigment in the unattached gingiva. You've got the lesion in the unattached gingiva. And then in the attached gingiva toward the crown, you, you don't have uh, any, any pigment. Uh, that is the line of demarcation in this particular patient. So anything that is toward the root tip away from that line or in the unattached gingiva is an indication, not always the case, but a good indication that the tooth or teeth adjacent to that area are possibly non-vital. So take a look at this radiograph of the exact same patient. What do you see there? Pretty obvious, huh? You've got a really large pulp cavity diameter in that tooth as opposed to the pulp cavity diameter in the other teeth. Uh, you do have a large pulp cavity diameter in that first premolar there as well. And if you look around that root tip, you possibly have a lucency there as well that would indicate that that tooth is non-vital. But any time or almost every time that you see that increase in pulp cavity diameter, that tooth is non-vital, and the recommendation is either root canal or extraction. In this case, we all also have, if you look at the, the root to the right on the tooth, not the one where the arrow is, but the one to the right of that, which is a distal root on that third premolar, you definitely see that lucency around there, and that... It, in addition to the changes that you see around the other root where the arrow is that are not so blatant are the reason why you have a lesion. The tooth has died and the necrotic pulp has affected the bone, caused inflammation and destruction in that bone, and then that inflammation and infection gets past the bone and into the soft tissue, and that's where that lesion came from. Look at the other side uh, to compare and see that that's uh, perfectly normal versus this side where you've got all those changes. So take a look at this image. See what you see. There are some changes there uh, that you can note. They're not really, really obvious, but there are some changes there. So take a quick look at that. Make a note of what you see. And if you look closely there, you're going to see that there's some discoloration. Look at these three teeth versus the color of the other teeth, especially that second left maxillary incisor that's to the right of the arrow there. That one's pretty white. Those are kind of cream colored. So that's a good indication there might be some problems there. And you look at that radiographically, and lo and behold, two of those have a very distinct lucency. All four of those central incisors have increase in the pulp cavity diameter compared to the pulp cavity diameter in those lateral incisors. So those are all dead. The lucency, again, same pathophysiology, tooth dyes, necrotic pulp, it causes inflammation and subsequent bone destruction. So again, those are extractions. Uh, they 
could have root canals done on them. We don't recommend that in general for incisors, but that might be an option. Uh, I would never personally recommend root canals on those with that much bone loss. Uh, my thought is I want to get that inflammation and bone change gone now, not in a couple weeks when that bone heals. So I'm going to recommend extraction on those uh, every time. Now, you cannot read in those lucencies like we see here into maxillary incisors on a consistent basis because we see a lot of the chevron sign or a lot of lucencies around normal incisors too. So you have to be really careful in interpreting those changes. And if there's any question you need to get the patient back, reevaluate radiographically in 6 to 10 to 12 months to see if those changes are progressing, if there's any question. And these here, um, looking at that, I would say those are perfectly normal and would not make any recommendations other than to maybe re-radiograph in a year or so, depending on how old that patient was. Another example here, very subtle change. Look at that second premolar versus the two adjacent teeth. It's a little bit more cream colored but not something that we jump on just looking at that grossly. And then look at that pulp cavity diameter on that tooth. That tooth is non-vital. I wouldn't say that there's changes yet around the root tip, but that would ensue if it's not already starting and we just can't see definitive evidence that it's there. I would say probably what changes are there would be impossible to differentiate from bone changes uh, that are superimposed around that tooth root. So I uh, would not be able to call that by any means. But that tooth is an extraction uh, in our practice and in yours uh, versus root canal, although uh, the owner should be given the option, but they're almost always going to opt for extraction. And we probably would not even give an option for root canal on that tooth. It's not a not a critical tooth and not one that we would think would be in the best interest of the patient to save. Moving on, um, let's talk briefly about something else that's really, really common as a case example, and that is tooth resorption in cats. So we've got this image. Take a look at that. Look at those two teeth that you can see. There's obvious changes there uh, around with the bleeding on that um, third premolar there, the one on the right side. The fourth premolar, you have to look really close to see the changes on, on that. But take a look at that, see what you think, and then I'm going to show you the radiograph. So obvious on the third premolar, we've got replacement resorption with bone. There's no root structure there that's visible. It's all bone replacing the tooth root. The crown's affected, the, the margin uh, where all that inflammation was grossly uh, is causing all that inflammation there where the crown has been dissolved and the gum is growing into that. But look at the tooth to the left, look at the crown, look at the shade in that crown, and then look back at the tooth itself. You can see that pink hue in the crown especially on the, the right side there, or the right side of the, the, the middle crown or the middle cusp, and then look at it on the radiograph. You see that really nice white tip, and then you see that gray as opposed to the molar to the left of it. So that is radiographically the same thing that we're seeing grossly with that pink, and that's where the crown is involved with tooth resorption, which might get not picked up, unless you're really looking at that closely. So you have to really closely evaluate that in order to make that determination. And so um, there's that area outlined that I'm talking about. So what we would do is, again, we're going to turn that patient over. We're going to look at it like we would be looking at it surgically with the crowns facing us. And in order to, to resolve that, what we would do would be to go in there, open that tissue up, and take our little diamond football, diamond round burr, or very carefully a carbide round burr and go in there and remove 
the crown down to where we have smooth bone, smooth all that out, extract that other tooth, and then close that, and that will take care of that problem for that individual patient.